Okay, so uh, we, today we are uh, starting to, to build, uh, as, as I said, the server-side components uh, for, our, uh, for web, uh, our web applications. So right now we, uh, we did all the work inside the browser, and it's nice, but uh, the problem is that the browser has only so much information. For example, the state of the, of the components uh, will be lost. Uh, uh, whenever you you reload uh, the application, you navigate away and so on, and so we uh, we need to have some some component where some architectural component where we may have the persist at least the persistence of the state. So we want to persist to save uh, permanent permanently some information so that it can be retrieved later. And also, if you have an applica web application that, of course, uh, uh, has many users that connect to that application, uh, so everyone with their own browser, uh, all of them should share the same view of the state information. And, uh, and that's, this means that this information should be stored in a central place where everybody can access it, can read it, and can modify it, and so on. So um, we are uh, looking at uh, how to one of the ways not to build the server-side applications in, in JavaScript. Okay, there are many other options. We are not forced uh, to build a web server using um, JavaScript. Any language would do, any framework will do, because in any case, the, the client and the server will only exchange information using HTTP, and so they are totally decoupled from the point of view of uh, programming languages. Okay, but, <clears throat> but since we are um, we became familiar with uh, JavaScript and Node. Uh, we'll try to stay uh, within this uh, ecosystem, also on the server side. Mm -hmm. uh, it, can, it can also give us some opportunity for reusing some classes or some code, uh, both in the client and in the server. Uh, so we are talking about uh, the Express, uh, uh, let's say, uh, module for uh, for Node. Mm -hmm. um, Express is uh, one possible library for uh, implementing a web server uh, in javascript it's not a high performance web server we would not want to to serve a big website or uh, something with a with a very large uh, traffic uh, but it's enough uh, for for starting and for serving uh, simple uh, apis uh, just to 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 make it clear we are not building a, a website uh, a website on the server side so we are not going to generate uh, uh, HTML pages from the server it can be done okay but it's not in the philosophy of our single page applications so uh, the web server for us uh, will just be uh, a location a place uh, to uh, implement some APIs that we may use later on uh, for um, that the client side may use okay so a lot of uh, capabilities of the web server are not in interesting for us. For example, the generation of HTML pages, the templating of the of the page themselves, because for us the page will be built uh, totally on the client side uh, with React components. Okay, uh, the server is just a, a location where I can call a set of APIs, and these APIs will be useful for um, reading and writing data and uh, say for storing the state of the application doing authentication and so on so the server in our in this course will never generate a user interface will only respond to a set of uh, api calls and we will do that uh, through of course the http protocol so as i mentioned uh, in the in the messages on slack uh, I, we are not uh, explaining for the 15th time uh, what uh, was the HTTP protocol. I ask you to, to have a look. Uh, and I will just uh, remember that uh, uh, we are talking about a client server protocol where we have a request and a response. And if we have some idea about the, the formats of the requests and responses that may have, uh, will have uh, uh, some headers and somebody so uh, both the request message and the response message may have uh, one or more headers and may have uh, a, a body uh, part in the request and the same for the response okay we are we are we need to be a bit we will be to become a bit more familiar with this part uh, because we will be using uh, these messages this uh, type of protocol uh, messages 
that were invented for sharing HTML pages. Okay, we are we are going to use them in a different way uh, for uh, making say remote calls uh, to APIs uh, to a, a web server. So um, remember that in the request uh, you may have different uh, methods. The HTTP protocol supports different methods. Uh, the web uh, works uh, basically 99% with the get method uh, when you are navigating a website. Um, and sometimes also the post method is used for submitting forms. Okay, um, But HTTP supports met many more methods and we'll try uh, to exploit these methods just to um, explain what kind of operation we are asking to the server. Hmm? Um, basically, uh, apart from all the details uh, that are, I'm skipping, uh, we 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 should remember okay the, the main characteristics of these methods okay uh, so basically just uh, to to study together this table uh, that will be useful for us uh, these are the main methods that methods that we are maybe uh, exploring uh, in the rest uh, except maybe for head so the get method is used to ask a resource from a server so usually the, the get request doesn't have anybody doesn't have the, the body of the request is not supported for the get method and normally uh, we have a response that contains in its body the uh, the the content of the of the resource that we have uh, asked um, this column idempotent says the whether the request can be done more than once with the same result. So an idempotent request is a request where, or with a HTTP uh, transaction uh, that if if it's repeated, it will deliver the same result. So the idea is that if you implement something with the get method uh, and you call the get method uh, two or three times in a row. Okay, you will always get the same result uh, without modifying the state of the application, the state of the server. Okay, um, this is not a characteristic, uh, um, an automatic characteristic of the met get method. Since we are going to implement our own handlers for the get methods, we need to ensure that this is true. So this is a requirement of the protocol that translates into requirements. Uh, uh, for uh, the implementation of the server. And of course, it may be some uh, assumption that the client uh, may do about this request. Uh, uh, on the contrary, when you are making the, when we are using POST, uh, usually we are sending data from the client to the server. So in the request, uh, uh, of course, we, we must send this data into the body of the request. And we are not expecting anything back usually, or may, maybe we can have something back, but it's not uh, uh, required. And uh, uh, in this case, the post requests are not idempotent in the sense that uh, um, if I'm sending a post message a second time or a third time, I will be changing every time the state of the server. So sending a post once or sending a post twice will have normally different results okay imagine a post uh, with the comment that we will use to add a new information a new task a new exam into our um, application so if you post it twice okay maybe the second time it will add an, another copy or duplicate of the same information or the first time posting the data may get through and the second time it will give an error because that exam was already present OK, so repeating a post is not uh, um, uh, is not free, it's not uh, something that you can decide to do or not, uh, because it will get different information, you will uh, achieve a different result. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a, a variation of the post, uh, which is called put, mm -hmm. uh, which is seldom used in HTML pages, it is not used at all, because for forms, so usually uh, if you are if you are developing HTML form, you can only submit with the get and the post methods. The other methods are just for client-server programming. And uh, the difference between post and put is uh, semantically is that post will uh, add the new information, and put will replace current information. 
so if you want to replace uh, some information about uh, uh, one item uh, so you are you assume that this information is already there and you replace it with a new copy and of course if you're replacing the new copy a second time with another identical copy the result will be exactly the same check so calling put once or calling it twice uh, will achieve the same result uh, we will get more familiar with these methods uh, today uh, we'll translate these characteristics which are something that you find in the documentation of the HTTP protocol, which is something at the network level, we will translate them at, at, the, at the application level, where we see how to exploit these different characteristics of these methods for uh, describing what kind of APIs uh, we want to achieve. Okay, but first of all, we need to have a web server hmm, before implementing some uh, application semantics. And uh, uh, we see how to do that uh, with this uh, Express, which is one of the many web frameworks uh, that are compatible that are running on uh, on node.js um, <clears throat> uh, node already contains a predefined module called the http which is basically a low level uh, interface that gives you uh, uh, lets you manage uh, the individual packets but it's not very friendly for the programmer and so many other uh, frameworks were developed uh, on top of the HTTP uh, built-in module, of course, for having a simpler way of creating applications. And so the one <clears throat> that we are using, <clears throat> sorry, um, is uh, uh, Express, which is one of the most popular. But if you are looking uh, around, you see that there are many of them uh, that are becoming more or less popular in a, in, a time, in a given time frame, then they are forgotten, then they are discovered again, and so on. But there's a lot of, of movement uh, uh, around this kind of uh, frameworks. They all do, or mostly, they all do the same job. They serve the HTTP protocol. They are web servers. So given an HTTP request, they give you the means of specifying some fragment of code that will build the response of that request okay so for us uh, express we can install that into our projects so i i i prepared an empty project for this week uh, it's called the week uh, nine uh, if you want it's uh, it's uh, I, I pushed that uh, on github yesterday uh, and uh, we can Okay, uh, in a, I created a folder, Express as an empty folder. So for uh, creating a new uh, application, we must first uh, uh, install the Express module uh, in Node. Okay, so we just have to install Express, of course, after initializing the folder for creating the package.json file. So uh, we let's let's do that. Uh, npm init. Uh, let's initialize. Uh, whatever yes okay so now we have the packet to json in our folder express and we inside here we must install express ah stupid me okay uh, the folder my folder here is called express Sorry, the name it Express with uh, web server. Mm, okay. Okay, so it's going. Okay, so right now we have the mod, not modules, not modules folder. Uh, sorry, this is one web server. The not modules that now contains uh, a lot of stuff, uh, of course, as, as usual. Uh, also, uh, especially what we are interested in is the is the Express module. So right now we can uh, start uh, uh, developing our uh, our server applications. Okay, so at this point. Uh, uh, running a web server means just uh, running with Node uh, a file 
the index.js or server.js, uh, depends on how you want to call it, uh, that just contains the information for running uh, the Express server. Mm -hmm. So we start a server application, we just run uh, a normal JavaScript file, and this file will contain a, a listen instruction that will put the server in, in listen mode and will start accepting uh, inform, um, let's say a request from outside. Okay. And uh, this enters a sort of a loop where waiting for requests until you interrupt uh, the application. Uh, so every time you modify something, you are editing, you are developing something, you should uh, uh, usually interrupt the server, uh, control C, and then run it again. And this may become boring, or maybe you are you modified something, you forgot to restart the server, so you are still debugging or using the old versions. Um, uh, my suggestion is that you can use a, um, a program which is called Nodemon, which is part of the, of course, uh, NPM uh, and Node ecosystems. And Nodemon uh, is uh, basically able to execute any script. We are using that for, with the server, with Node normally. So we'll call Node to execute a script. But at the same time, Nodemon will monitor the source codes, so the JavaScript files. Uh, from which uh, your script depends and every time you are uh, some of these files are modified so you write some code and you save the file not one checks that uh, the file or uh, detects that the file has been modified and automatically restarts uh, uh, your server so uh, for our convenience we'll start the server with the nodemon command that should be installed of course and uh, uh, just remember to install it globally in your system and not inside the project, okay? Minus G uh, means install it uh, globally in the computer and not in this particular project because we want to have access, first to have access to Nodemon for, from every project. And second, we don't want to pollute uh, our uh, Node module with something which is only used for development. Uh, it's not really needed for, uh, it's not part of the project itself. OK, um, maybe uh, you need to uh, use uh, the administrator account uh, for installing this. Depends on where and how you install the um, node, uh, all the Node.js packages. OK, so this Nodemon command is just uh, so some, something that watches for changes in files uh, and restarts the application, the, the, the Node command uh, every time. OK. Uh, so what's the structure of a, of a web application with Express? Uh, of course, first of all, let's have a look at the code here. So this is the minimal code for a web application. First of all, of course, we need to import the package. So remember, we are in the server. We are in Node.js again. So the, the syntax for importing packages is again require and not import. And uh, Express is a function that is used uh, to create uh, an application object. So if you call the Express function that you just uh, imported with the require statement, uh, you get a new object that contains your application. And this application will run when you call the listen function on it. Uh, the listen function will, uh, for which is a property of the, of the application, will start. I really start the server. So from that moment on, your code will stop. So the the, the lines here uh, will uh, uh, are not needed. You don't need to do anything more after this instruction, because asynchronously it will start listening to HTTP requests on a given port. Usually we use something around 3000, 3001, and 2, or something like that. Um, and we start uh, uh, listening for a request. In the middle, so we are just creating the object and starting the server. In the middle, we define the application. Okay, We define which are the uh, requests that we are listening to and what we do uh, for each of them. And so we are, let's say, building a set of uh, routes in the application that will uh, listen for specific uh, URLs, for example, the home page. And for each of them, 
they will execute a callback uh, for deciding what to do with that uh, um, with that information and so basically uh, apart from the first and the last lines which are quite standard our application is just a set of uh, uh, route definitions we define a route we define um, what is the method so I'll define a route means uh, calling the app dot get or app dot post or app dot put we specify the, the HTTP method that we are expecting we specify a path okay where this uh, uh, route will listen and we specify uh, the callback and this callback will receive uh, two objects from the express framework request and response uh, which are usually abbreviated like rec and res okay so it's very confusing because they are very similar names uh, rec stands for request and res stands for response so remember that the request is the http request that came in so it's an object that represents the request coming in that contains all the information that was in the request duly parsed and converted into javascript properties and uh, um, the response object is a, a, a basically an empty object that we have to fill with whatever needs to go inside the response package that should go back to the server itself so to the client itself okay so request is some information we receive the response is where we build our response and for example the send method of the response will uh, populate the uh, body of the response and will send it back uh, to, to the um, to the client um, so the syntax of these routes are is quite easy so let's may, we may try one of them uh, in a second uh, we are just uh, okay specifying a method uh, a path and the handler function okay and this handler as we said is uh, just a normal callback that will be called automatically whenever some clients around the world uh, will make a request to this web server and this, the request will match this specific path that we are listening to okay so the path is uh, matching the request and uh, whenever i get a request the express will try to match all the paths that, that i declared of course the path declared with that specific method get or post um, and the the first one that matches will be called uh, and uh, the callback function will be executed and from that point on it's your own code that decides what happens so App, uh, Express gives you the, way, the, the, the infrastructure, the framework for uh, executing your code in the right moment with the right request. Then you can do, you are free to do what you want here. Um, okay, before going to some object, let's try to build it, build a very simple. So inside our web server, we create a, a server.js file, for example. Yeah, and we just, uh, create a new server const express require express then uh, we can create the application itself and we can start the application at the end the first parameter of the listen method is the port in which we are listening. So maybe we can use it. <coughs> we can define a constant. Maybe 3000. So the last instruction will be running the web server. App.listen. Uh, the first parameter is the port number. And the second parameter would be uh, a callback function that is is called when uh, when the the web server actually started. Okay, so a callback for the start event, and we we, we may write console.log dot 
something like uh, uh, server started at HTTP localhost and then the port that we decided and uh, slash okay we created this server.js which is minimal so it's an empty web server we can run it normally with node server.js and there's something missing cannot find module express Ah, oh, sorry, an X press with the X, not the S. Okay, and now we have this server started at this uh, link. So I in the console.log, I just put this so that uh, because it's easier to click on here and open the browser, basically. Hmm? Uh, right now, I we can do anything with that. So if I try to click here and open a browser, uh, I will get nothing because the browser will be trying to request something from that website uh, but uh, nothing is responding the web server is running but the uh, this URL is not uh, uh, we are not listening on that uh, on that address so for uh, for responding some, something uh, we must at least listen to for example, the home page uh, uh, address uh, app dot get. So whenever I do a get on the slash on the home page on the main page, then execute <clears throat> some callback request response function code. Hmm? And here we can uh, this method here, this function, this callback will be called when the user, when the browser points at the home page of this website. So uh, the simple thing we can do is just return the hello world, which is response dot send. Uh, here we should send an HTML text, an HTML page here. If, uh, but uh, for the moment we, we can we may only just uh, from your server okay and uh, we just re uh, return a string uh, we're just trying to understand how it works how it works so if I go to the browser and try to reload it nothing happens again because and that's the trick i uh, we, i forgot to stop and restart the server again and so i will i'm still even if i modify the file i'm still serving the old version that's why we are trying to use this nodmon nodmon instead of node that will do the, exactly the same will run the server for us but whenever i modify something if i save this file you see the nodmon uh, detects the change and restarts the server automatic automatically hmm? so that's uh, it was very easy to forget about uh, uh, restarting and debugging for hours just to remember that okay I didn't uh, restart the server so right now it should work or not depends on the Local was 3000. Uh, sometimes there's a, there's a problem with the, with the WSL. So let me just. Uh, local host 3000. Yes, yes. The server is working. There's something uh, wrong with uh, um, with the forwarding of the port 3000 uh, from the Linux part uh, to my Windows part. So it's something that uh, I, I I'll try to to correct or to understand how 
can be corrected. Uh, so it's just a, a, a Linux Windows issue. The reason why this is not uh, forwarding this port for that reason. Usually, it should be automatic, but uh, and yesterday it worked. Okay, never mind. Maybe I will try to run it from Windows directly. Um, I hate the strings when they happen in the wrong moment. Um, okay, so let's let's go on, and then we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll work directly uh, without these problems. Okay, uh, more details about the, what we are trying to do uh, of the about the main objects that we're working with uh, is the um, request object and the response object. Um, so the re as we said, uh, the request object contains uh, uh, the information that comes from the client request. So basically, uh, everything that is uh, within the client request uh, is accessible in an uh, easy way through uh, properties of the request object. Uh, for example, uh, if the request uh, was, for example, I don't know, um, a post or a put, and we expect the request to contain a body in the, in the HTML package, we will have a body property <clears throat> from which we can extract information. Okay, um, we can extract uh, uh, some uh, uh, query string. So imagine that we have a URL with uh, some question marks in it. We'll see some examples. Uh, a equal to B, for example, you know the syntax for passing parameters in URLs. All these uh, uh, um, couples, uh, name value pairs, are available inside the query um, uh, property in the request. So we don't need to do any of the parsing of the URL of the, the or the nav, nor any of the decoding of the of the body, because uh, everything is already uh, ready for us uh, in the request object. So we can inspect which kind of request we got, what parameters that it had, okay, and uh, we can build the response. So the right hand side, the response objects are the methods for us to build a response. Um, the main method here is uh, send, where we can just basically send uh, a file or a string, and this will be returned in the uh, response body. Um, if what we are trying to send is an object in JSON, uh, which is a JavaScript object, we can decide to serialize it into the JSON format. Uh, we'll say a few words about JSON later on, but it's very simple, just serialized objects uh, in strings. So the JSON method will automatically take an object, a JavaScript object, serialize it into a string using the JSON syntax, and will automatically set the correct headers, HTTP headers, um, for, uh, for declaring that this content type is uh, of type JSON. And these two methods, JSON and send, will automatically send the response. Uh, there, uh, there are other methods like uh, uh, AND, for example, that will just send the... Uh, so, so there are other methods that will just build or set some property of the response, but will not send it immediately. So in that case, uh, you need to call AND to, uh, to, to actually send it. So some of these methods uh, store some information in the response and then uh, automatically send it. Some other methods only store some information, like, for example, setting the response status. And the response status normally is 200. I want, me some, uh, I want to make it uh, 400, 404, or whatever. Okay, so uh, I, I need to change the status of the response. But changing the status is not enough because it's not definite. It's not the only operation I need to do. I need to change the status and the return a uh, content, for example. So in those cases, uh, you will call many different uh, um, functions to change the content of the response. 
and finally you will have one call to one of the methods that will actually send the response and sending the response basically it will be the job of uh, those methods send here send 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 you see some of them send the response and also and will send the response with whatever we have uh, in our hand at the moment with the current uh, the current built object so we are we may build the response object bit by bit um, there's a mistake here in this slide uh, because it's not uh, uh, send status send status it was an old uh, it's deprecated it's an old method the correct one is here is uh, called the status so these are the main methods that we are going to use send will actually send uh, what the string or the HTML file that we built here and we'll send the response in the current uh, state so if you are calling a res.end immediately then it will return an empty response but we may before calling end we, we may add some other uh, information like the status and so on so that when we are calling end it will res, uh, return with some uh, with some real content uh, why is and uh, useful well for example if you are uh, implementing a post method okay the post uh, will not expect any any response back post sends some information from the client to the server and we don't expect the server to reply anything the response body should be empty but the response should be there you know in some way okay we, sh we, we must have a, a, some sort of a response in order to close the HTTP connection so that the client may close the HTTP connection it needs an HTTP response back from the server we don't have anything to say but we need to close the connection that is when the end method is useful because it will actually close it if you forget it because you are doing all the hard work of processing the post creating a new object uh, but you, are, you forget to close the request then the uh, browser will still be hanging on a, on a request that it never ends hmm? and so always remember that you must uh, close the request somehow okay by sending something or by sending nothing but the request must be closed uh, in any case so the other useful method is status so by default we are returning a 200 status uh, but we may also return any kind of other um, of other status code depending on what went wrong maybe on our side or the, on the on the parameters from the bra from the client and uh, uh, you see that status is a method that just sets the status code but doesn't send anything right now it doesn't send anything to the client right now because it will be later uh, we need to use a send or, a, or a end after setting the status code okay so these are the main methods that we are going to use nothing nothing more than that basically uh, because all the work uh, will be inside uh, inside inside our code okay there's also a redirect method mm, okay it may be useful for web applications uh, we are not doing that uh, uh, in since we are just implementing uh, api servers okay um so this is the basic uh, uh, mechanism where we actually need to insert our own code here and just uh, you know, uh, uh, okay, Im implement the logic that, that we want. Okay. Uh, there are, fortunately, some ways of extending this behavior. Uh, so, for example, uh, the, um, the web server is quite silent it doesn't tell you anything at what, what is happening so for debugging it's a problem because it doesn't log any of its uh, output it doesn't do any logging uh, it doesn't do any validation and so on so there are um, there's a mechanism an easy, easy mechanism uh, that extend express provides which is called uh, middleware uh, and this is what uh, these kind of extensions are what uh, make one framework different from another okay right now the code that we have uh, could just uh, use just the HTTP predefined module in uh, in uh, uh, in node.js okay we are not doing anything special 
but Express gives you a framework for um, for extending the handling of of, of, of each request. Okay, uh, what are these uh, so-called middlewares, Express middlewares? Are just functions that uh, are put into the pipeline of the uh, processing of the request. Okay, so uh, every time a request comes in from the so we have an HTTP request 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 uh, you know that this will be processed by your callback okay the callback that we write that needs to build uh, finally a response and we need to send it to the server to the client okay okay this is the normal behavior with middlewares what we may have is having some a set of sorry a set of functions middleware one middleware two and so on another middleware that will take care of our uh, request and may modify it may extend it so each of them will get a copy of the request and response and may do something with them may modify the request so by adding by parsing some field and then adding some properties doing some validation doing some checks doing some parsing or modifying the response so preparing the response setting some headers uh, for you so that you will have when I said before that the response object starts empty okay it will start empty here at the beginning but uh, if you have one or more middlewares this re response object will, may be already well, may, may contain already some information that the middlewares have put uh, uh, in there for you and finally we have our function okay our callback function that gets again nothing changing for that it will still receives a request and the response objects but these objects have been pre-processed may have been pre-processed in some way by these middlewares um, so implementing a middleware is very simple if you just have a function that receives a copy of these two objects it may modify them and finally it will call a method called next which is the third parameter of the that the callback receives you can create your own middleware we can define our middleware if we want it's just a function it's just a javascript function nothing special just need to to observe this uh, this rule of calling next uh, uh, before returning and uh, whenever you want a given path a given route to uh, be processed by one or more middlewares you must just insert them in between here so you have your app.get here you specify a path you have your callback but between the path and the callback you can have uh, the name of a function that you want to call for pre-processing the request can be your own function or can be some function that we use uh, that we import some, from some from uh, some module that which already is already predefined um, we may have one function we can have more functions m1 or m2 m3 the different function middlewares that can be just listed like there or put into an array of functions usually we see just one second parameter which is a, if we have one, more than one middleware to call in sequence to process in sequence you just create a list of functions remember these are just function references so the name of the function is not the function call okay don't put the the parentheses here we are not calling the function here no we are just giving the reference to the function that will be called in the pipeline of, of processing your request uh, so that's easy uh, there are a lot of middleware that are just ready to use uh, for us and uh, there's also um, let's say an easier way of automatically inserting these middlewares in all the requests uh, there's a method use that registers a middleware 
with your application. So this means that if you call use, it will automatically insert this middleware function in all the next requests. So instead of putting the middleware name in each and every method, in each and every path that we are defining, you just write it once and will be inserted in all the functions. So it depends on what you want to do, of course. If, uh, the, if you have a middleware that is only needed uh, in, uh, in one or two different calls or in one or two different uh, methods, then you can define or you can specify it on the method definition. But it's a middleware, uh, um, vice versa. If uh, you want to apply that processing in every, to every, um, you, every path, every route, uh, then you can just register it at the beginning and all the methods after that point in your code will automatically have inherited uh, this kind of middleware uh, in, in in order of course hmm? it will be called before other specific uh, middlewares or if you want just to apply that and you know which are the paths in which you want to insert it so one or sorry, one or more paths uh, maybe this path will be a wild card and uh, uh, this middleware will only be automatically applied in the request that fall inside that path. Okay, so you can specify it. So it's a sort of an automatic way of inserting some pre-processing. So this is how we customize our server. The server just does the basic job, handling HTTP requests and, and responses. Um, but if we add some middleware, so these requests and responses are, are pre-processed in a way so that our code, finally, our callback, which uh, uh, will have uh, um, an easier job to do because, the, 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 because of this pre-processing uh, that we had. OK, so it's a very simple mechanism, basically. Uh, just one more callback in the line of processing, uh, but uh, it's quite useful. Hmm? For example, uh, one a very important middleware is the static, uh, the static one. This is already predefined by uh, by Express. So when we, um, uh, yes, I, I I reply to Alessandro in the chat that is asking whether this path uh, uh, it can be applied also to the uh, subpaths. It depends on the path syntax. Okay, the path syntax we still haven't seen it. Uh, maybe just a string or a regular expression, uh, and so it depends on how you write it. You can select whether it applies only to a single path or uh, to a group of paths that match uh, some uh, some some specific pattern. So uh, usually, of course, it will be more useful if you are specifying a, a, a wildcard or a uh, um, a set of paths with a single expression, otherwise you could just uh, add the middleware on the single route. Hmm? But uh, it can be customized uh, with the path syntax. Um, so the, the static, uh, and this is an example, for example, already of that, okay? Um, the static middleware uh, automates the, the the response to all uh, static files. So imagine you have a website with, where we have some images, uh, some style sheets, uh, and some other images, and so on, and some static files. Uh, ideally, or uh, you would need to define a get route for each of them, app.get uh, images kit and .j, jpeg. And there you can have just have to load the file and return it, okay? Uh, for each of them, because these are different routes. They all, they all have the same behavior, but they are different routes, and uh, they must be programmed one by one in the in the body of the application. But actually, the logic is very stupid. We, we only have to just take a file and serve it uh, statically. Statically means we don't have to do any processing on that file. Okay, so the um, middle, uh, static middleware is just doing this for us. Okay, uh, it, we specify a folder, maybe slash public, in our project, okay, that will contain some files. And uh, every request 
will be just uh, uh, translated by looking inside this folder and returning the file. So if uh, we have this URL, like uh, JS, app.js, that may be the client side application, so it's not JavaScript code to be executed on the server, but to be served to the client, then the, uh, the static middleware will, will look into uh, public current directory public slash js slash up to js and if the file is there it will just return it in the http response or otherwise it will give an 404 file not found error okay so we are publishing a folder in our project entirely as the main uh, website of the application uh, of course uh, and what we are doing here is that uh, this is the uh, behavior of this uh, middleware function and we are applying that to the whole website but maybe we don't want to have the because in this way we are making a, on, um, a static only website so everything uh, will be static uh, otherwise, we could just mount a static folder inside uh, uh, some some path. So, for example, here we are setting the path. So this is the second form of the URL: app that use path and middleware. And in this case, uh, we are mounting the static middleware below the static uh, path. So everything below static, okay, uh, will be managed by this middleware. Anything outside static will uh, not be managed by this. Uh, this middle will not be called by anything outside the static uh, path specification. So in this way, we are mapping uh, this uh, JS app.js not to the root of the document tree bar, but to the you see the static folder. So whenever the URL contains a slash static, we know that uh, the middleware, the static middleware, will look into the public folder for a file with the same name. So the name of the folder and the name of the URL should not be the same. In this case, static is the public part, the public name, and public is the internal folder in our project. And everything outside static will be managed normally without this middleware, and so we need to define the routes uh, for handling uh, dynamic requests. So this, so this is useful if you have a folder in your project that will contain images or, or static resources in general, files uh, that need, just need to be transferred, and you don't want to handle these routes uh, automatically. Um, uh, Alessio, yes, it's a way of saying that for all the paths in, in, uh, below this, uh, this path specification, uh, this middleware will be automatically inserted, okay? Like you, uh, you could uh, uh, write this in each and every uh, path, but in this way we are, that's a, it's a catch-all specification, uh, and it will be called for uh, for all of them. Hmm? Yes, uh, this is what. Um, after, just remember, this will happen uh, after you call this uh, instruction. So all the routes that you may define before in your code don't have this, this middleware applied. It will be applied only uh, by, by, the, by the, the following routes, if you, if you want. So you can decide some group of routes that will have a middleware, some other will not, and so on. It, it's, it's even more complicated than that, because if you want to have some more selection, you can create new routers inside the application and each of them, we may have different middlewares, but we don't need to go into such complexity. Um, and, uh, sorry, I, where the, okay. I wanted to show you uh, this slide uh, where we have a list of the middlewares that are uh, used frequently, that we will use frequently in some way. Uh, some of them are uh, predefined uh, and some are, uh, Often used that are already suggested by the by the Express uh, web page. Hmm? 
uh, so some, some of them are already integrated into the express package and some some others need need to be installed uh, separately um, uh, we we saw the static one okay we just express the static uh, there's another important one uh, which is called uh, Morgan uh, that we may uh, may see uh, right now and it's a uh, it's a logger so we notice that when we make some request uh, the the server is basically silent uh, it doesn't tell you anything uh, the Morgan uh, middleware adds some log information every time a route is called so if i go here and uh, we see that some of them are express middleware so that they are already integrated in express and the second table is called additional modules so it's something that you should uh, install later on and the morgan just to see what what does uh, it's a package uh, okay, it should be installed in Node, but it's already built by the same team that builds Express. You see, it's, we are still in the Express uh, website. Uh, and it will uh, install, uh, say, print a line on the console every time a request is received. And uh, we have some uh, uh, different types of formats. Uh, for example, Tiny is the shortest one. Or there's, there's some some table here that will tell you uh, the syntax in which you are uh, printing the information, like dev, short, long, tiny, and so on. So this is useful because we see on the on the console of the server which are the requests that you are getting. So sometimes when we don't get a request with something's not working, we want to see what is happening. And for adding that, as an example. We can try to add this, so we need to start, stop the application because we need to install the logger. Okay, then we can restart easily the, the server. And we just have to require Morgan. And once we have this middleware, we can apply that to every request in our application. So app.use Morgan with the format, for example, uh, dev for developers. So this means that all the next requests will call Morgan the Morgan media, so Morgan will return a function that will be the callback, okay, the, the middleware itself. And so inside here, we know that before processing our request, uh, this code will be executed. So we are going to see on the on the console the request that we are doing. So if I save the file here and I try to redo the same request, okay, we are uh, downloaded again this file this home page and uh, on the console of the um, of the of the server morgan printed one new line okay so this is the the, the request that they that they got this is the status code of the response and this is the time and the size of the response itself okay so the computation time the delay in, in answering and the uh, and the size of the of the file that is sent so every time i receive a request i can see something and in development of course it's, it's crucial to be able to see uh, what the server is doing so this is uh, like a, an easy way of doing that uh, as i said if this is only applied to the URLs after this. So if by mistake I had put this use afterwards, it will log all the queries that, that I define later, but not not any of the queries that I defined that I already defined uh, above. Okay. So just remember, it's not uh, it's not something that changes how the application works. 
is something that changes how the single request works so when I define a request it's like I'm automatically inserting the middleware that match some path in this case I don't have the path specified here so there's no first parameter in the app to use and it means that will it applies uh, to the whole website hmm, to all of it okay um, uh, toward the end of the course we'll also have a look at the passport which is a um, a very uh, it's, a, it's a package for handling the login and logout and authentication of, of the of the users and there's also some validation maybe it's not in this table middleware that we are going to use okay uh, more details about the request and the response uh, how can i get from my uh, callback for my uh, route uh, implementation the information about the resources okay because if the resource is just static i don't need to do anything special uh, just return the, the result but uh, uh, many cases uh, the the, um, the requests uh, have some parameters here right? for example uh, i'm sending a form or i need to specify which uh, uh, user as a login or which is the course that they want to see the details of and so on and this is normally encoded in the URL and uh, the, it is automatically available in the query property of the request object okay so automatically uh, Express will parse uh, the, the string will you only match uh, the first part of the string so actually you are you, the path that you are defining here, the route will be just slash login, and all the rest will be automatically from the question mark on will be automatically parsed by um, by Express, and it will uh, uh, parse each of them and put every variable into a different sub property of uh, dot query of request dot query. So you are you immediately have this information there. Uh, if you have a post or a, or a put information, uh, put sorry comment. So we are submitting a form, for example, and the browser will submit a form, the data in a form in a special format, which is called uh, the, the form encoding. And uh, for uh, decoding that, uh, it's not done automatically. Uh, this information is stored in the request body. And by default, the body is not processed by Express, unless you install a middleware for processing the body. So, for example, uh, in the case of a form sent by a browser, uh, this uh, middleware URL encoded will automatically parse the body and put all the properties, so all the text inputs, uh, all the checkboxes and so on that have been sent in the form into the um, as, as property of the request.body so request.body is a strange property it starts empty if you don't do anything even if the request has some some content the body property will be empty unless you are using some middleware that will parse the, the text of the body and will create the properties inside inside body itself we are not going to use this in our uh, APIs because we are not. We will never submit a form directly to the server. No, the form submission is something that we will be handled by the client, by React, like we are we did last week in our exercises. Um, but in many cases, we are using maybe POST for creating a new element, okay, for storing some new data into the server. And in this case, it will be easier for us uh, to encode the information in json because it's just a native format for a javascript serialization so uh, in when we are sending information from the client to the server we will store it in the body of the request especially for post methods or for put methods because get doesn't have a body the, the, the get request doesn't have a body so it doesn't apply but for post and put we are storing some information into the body of the request and uh, uh, we may access the same properties of these objects uh, from the body uh, property if we use the middleware called uh, JSON, Express.json. 
so in this case we are able to extract this information uh, if uh, it's a common mistake just to try to uh, read the body properties without uh, uh, installing the middleware okay and uh, as we said uh, uh, also also to to answer to uh, to uh, Alessandro uh, that was asking uh, which are the actually paths that are matched by a given path specification we have different ways of doing that okay the simplest one is just giving a string prefix so what we are doing here is just and give a, a prefix uh, so everything that starts with this uh, will match okay also so be careful because if you are trying to match uh, uh, something it will uh, hide the next uh, maybe more detail so let's try to to make all this string distinct and not one as a subset of the others uh, so the normal the normal the default is just a, a, a string that will match the, at the beginning or you may have a regular expression using a regex uh, a syntax inside the string or using just a, a regex object in javascript we didn't see them uh, at the beginning of the course but uh, you there's a special syntax a slash slash for automatically created some regular expression objects uh, in, in javascript with a, with a syntax which is uh, uh, say more complete than the normal regular expression we have uh, into strings or we may have an array of all of those so if you have uh, one method that want where we want to match uh, more than one path uh, we can pass an array or a callback that returns an array of course uh, with all the different paths uh, that we want to manage hmm? uh, so we have all this uh, if you uh, go to this link here you see all the possibilities uh, for how to specify a path um, my suggestion don't try to be very fancy try to have very clear and distinct uh, urls uh, so that it's very easy to understand uh, which method is called uh, from a given URL, otherwise uh, it will be also a nightmare uh, to, to debug when something goes wrong. Okay, if you are becoming too complex, too clever, and say with the with the um, regular expressions. So these are, are uh, the parameters on the on the URL and the information in the in the request body are the native methods for passing information from the browser to the to the server okay these are already embedded in, in 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 the behavior of the server but then we have this capability of matching multiple strings and having one single callback uh, uh, responding to different uh, urls different strings different paths okay so let's put the two together express gives a, a, a capability of matching parametric paths okay uh, it's a, you, you may see it as a sort of a special syntax for a regular expression if you want to see it that way. Um, the idea is that if you specify um, a, a complete path with some fragments, uh, so some le folder levels that contain, ah, I hate you, that contain a column symbol, a column character here, okay? then express will match any url that has any kind of content inside uh, inside those uh, uh, elements inside those fragments of the url okay so for example we have a url where, with user slash 34 and books slash 8999 for example here and uh, uh, this will match actually will be matched by this path specification because it uses something slash books slash something else so with a single get we are uh, be able, we are able to catch different urls different addresses that for the browser's point of view they are all different addresses uh, but uh, uh, they will map well, will map they will map and will be uh, processed just by one single uh, callback and the nice uh, thing is that these parts of the URLs will be automatically extracted for you, for us, and will be stored inside the parameters, uh, params of the request object. Okay, 
and so our code will be able to use that information so we have three ways okay of uh, specifying some information when we are doing some call one is encoding the url uh, the url question mark a equal to three uh, in the url this information will be available into the request dot query dot a inside the query property we have all the parameters that we have in the url or we may have something to the body okay so we have maybe the body will contain an object uh, which is uh, property a as the value 3 and this will be when we will receive it uh, it will be into request dot body dot a just remember to use uh, the uh, express.json um, middleware that will trigger the decoding of the body parsing and the uh, of the body in json format and the third one will be again the url uh, like uh, slash uh, whatever abc slash colon a uh, in particular will be matched and we, so in that case you have the information in request dot params dot a hmm? so there are three different mechanisms uh, that we may use in different uh, in different moments according to our needs okay uh, we will try to um, so from the point of view of, of the http uh, protocol mm, nothing changes it just packets that go uh, forward and backwards um, one first difference is that the body of the request is only allowed with some methods so also to 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 start uh, answering antonio but we'll see more detail in the in the next set of slides uh, um, uh, the uh, store information in the body will be basically for uh, post or put methods okay well that have do have a body and need to have a body also uh, is storing a json object uh, doesn't have many size limitations so even this if these objects have many properties we don't care it's not a problem okay uh, while store information in the url uh, should be done carefully should we, we we don't want a url along 20 kilobytes or so okay uh, only maybe 100 characters some one or 200 characters maximum so we don't want to store a lot of information or very complex objects into the urls as query strings or as past components. Um, the difference between so this, these two, the query string and the path component, are applicable to every method. They are more used uh, in this case. The, the, the query string is more used in to get a method when we are trying to do some sort of a search or a filter operation. Usually, filter, filter usually uh, it's not a rule you can of course from the programming point of view you can do whatever you want but usually you have some something when you want to specify uh, might be a filter or or sorting order or something like that that will just modify uh, how the resource is returned and uh, but in the in the last case in the path component case we are actually mapping different urls and so from the point of view of the browser they will be different pages, different resources. And also for the navigation, for the caching of the information, they will be stored separately. And um, and, and so, uh, we'll, okay, we, we, we can easily build a, a different URL that represents, uh, looks like a different page or a different resource, but it's, uh, it's processed in the, in, the, in the same way, okay? So, but if you set up a bookmark for this uh, or, or share this address, uh, 
it will be one address which is different from the, the user 35 or, or something else uh, okay they will be stored at different urls like with the question mark basically the urls uh, the URL stops before the, the question mark uh, from the browser point of view mm. um, but uh, again it's a matter of, of conventions or, or or best practices uh, what i want to stress now is that uh, don't confuse uh, don't be confused with the difference between query, body, and params. There are three different mechanisms. All of three are available to us, uh, but they store uh, information into different paths, and they work um, simultaneously. So you may have a any uh, request where you can have some information into the query, some into the parameters, uh, and possibly some into the body. Okay, they, are, they, they work in parallel. You don't need to, to choose. <laughs> Uh, they are all available to us. Uh, okay, another uh, the last uh, middleware I wanted to to describe you, or at least uh, uh, um, a quick look, uh, is the uh, validation of the input. Okay, so right now in our code we are just uh, maybe receiving some parameters, but we want to be sure that uh, this user ID is a number. Okay, we can have some sort of matching regular expression, but maybe we have some ranges, minimum and maximum value for the number, or we want to be sure that uh, um, uh, here the password, uh, the user is not empty and the password is not, not empty and so on. So every time, um, every time the um, we we get we are getting some information from the browser in either of the three ways we need to check whether this information is sane is valid and so on okay and uh, we we can do that by hand with a lot of if statements or we can just use the validator syntax uh, sorry the, the middleware syntax by the using this uh, validation library we just have a look at the documentation in a second but basically the syntax is that uh, we are inserting an array of middleware functions and each middleware function will do some check okay uh, so in this case uh, we'll check uh, the information as it comes in so maybe we'll check that this uh, matches an email uh, string uh, that the password length is a minimum five and so on so we have a sort of a, a, a way of specifying which are the checks that we want to do and uh, inside so this is not doing anything uh, practically it does, it's not uh, uh, generating any errors it's just checking doing some checks on the request hmm, on the request object and these checks are stored into the request object itself and can be queried with this validation result function okay so it's a way of saying okay uh, before anything else do a set of checks and later on in my callback let's retrieve the results of the checks and see uh, which uh, errors uh, if there are any errors uh, then i will return some uh, uh, status error otherwise we can uh, proceed with the pro with the, um, with the um, with the execution of the of the method itself um, okay uh, we if you have a look here it's just a, um okay express validator is a package that we want to insert and we just uh, have to use uh, you are just you we don't use uh, we don't install it with user because we don't want the same validation rules uh, into every rule into every path okay uh instead we are adding the validation here you see that in this case uh, this was uh, uh, handling the post of a user url and this sent one and added one and two functions to middleware calls okay as i said before you may have one uh, more functions one after the other or an array of function is the same you may have in this case we have uh, um, one two three four parameter to the post method the fourth one is the callback 
the rule is that the first fourth one the last one is always your callback the first one is always the path and in between you have one or more zero or more middlewares that may be functions or array of functions okay and uh, uh, so this is just uh, how it works it's not a middleware that you want to register at the application level because every request will have different uh, checks to do hmm? uh, and of course you can do just a, a very very long uh, say an extensive explanation uh, so you can do okay the different uh, uh, also modifications uh, in this case sanitizations uh, of the uh, uh, of the different parts uh, of your query hmm? but uh, uh, the easy the easy one is uh, uh, like for example the validation that we have a set of validators that are using uh, basically using the validator.js library so this express validator is a middleware that inside uses validator.js that we may also uh, use in the client side is just a normal javascript library and so we can the methods for check and so on are the same as the validator library that which is automatically imported so if you want to do that some of that you can use this middleware and you can avoid writing writing the code uh, yourself um, you have a couple of questions uh, to address uh, I have Antonio um, before that was asking I didn't uh, ignore you on purpose but uh, um, I saw that not right now we can uh, give a more complete answer uh, which is the most secure way to pass a password hmm? uh, this is a big question and uh, uh, we are not going to fully uh, say which is the most secure way to pass a password because the answer of course is it depends uh, the normal security standards don't pass uh, passwords anymore okay if you are uh, creating or logging to you know google for example uh, there's an exchange of information back and forth uh, uh, down with the exchange of tokens basically where the password is never sent to the server so uh, passwords are something which is easy to use but they are a bit outdated in the in the web uh, world um, so let's say the, the best way to pass a password is not to pass the password uh, is to use some sort of a, a token exchanging or information exchanging mechanism for uh, for ensuring your identity where some computation is done on the client some on the server but the password never goes through that said um, uh, so excluding this uh, double exchange mechanism which are complex uh, basically they go under the name of uh, OAuth uh, open authentication and, uh, and so and there are the, the, the standard practices but are, we, we don't have the time I say in this course to, to, to to analyze those um, the second best choice is to just write the password uh, uh, maybe in clear uh, but over an encrypted an encrypted connection okay over an encrypted connection uh, where in HTTPS for example okay, connection where at least the password is only known to the browser and to the server and in between you don't have any information uh, in that case, we will be strongly against uh, putting the password uh, in the query string here because it will be visible in the browser history, for example. Okay, so in that case, the password should be inside uh, uh, the body, at least inside the body, where the request body is not visible in the history and is not cached by the browser. So while is being generated and sent of course it will be accessible but after that uh, the browser will not store it hmm? um, so in this case the suggestion is don't put that into the url because urls are visible are are stored into the history and so on are stored into the caches and so don't do that put that into the body uh, of the request hmm? but uh, usually we try not to do security by hand and use some libraries also that are able to store uh, encrypting the password in the in the, in the client uh, doesn't do any anything uh, useful because uh, 
um, then the server will be able to decrypt it so anybody will be able to decrypt it if uh, uh, so it doesn't have uh, doesn't help hmm? we'll see one library in one of the last weeks of the course called the Pas pa passport which is the standard library javascript de developers use to to handle this kind of problems hmm? um, lorenzo uh, is asking about the validation uh, done in the server side our client receives sanitized data uh, okay uh, beware what we are saying the here we are validating the input to the server from a request coming from the client okay so we have the client there's that sends a request to the server with some data attached to it okay we have a packet of data here um, attached to this request we are checking here at the server if the data is okay when we receive it from the client then the server will process this data okay so it can be checked it can be sanitized it can be whatever so the server can process data only after it has been checked then we know that the server will generate a response with some other data the prime that will go back to the client and this second data is completely separate from the first one so if uh, the client wants it it should validate uh, the data coming from the server when it received the response okay um, usually we tend not to do that because our client tends to trust our server in a way at least from the point of, uh, former point of view but at least should be checked but also remember that the client will receive data from the user and here we have a strong uh, uh, also validation point where this data user data is very usually dirty and full of errors and need to be checked by the client before sending it to the server the server will check the data again because it doesn't trust the client or because the client may have a bug and then they want to process some data which is not uh, not valid okay uh, so there are different at every data exchange the entity that receives the data is responsible for trusting the emitter mm, yes or not or a doing some extra checks hmm. um, bomb proof validation will be to use all of them hmm. all of them uh, the client especially when the client should not trust the user and the server should not trust the client these are the two main points if you are exposing a server to the to the internet uh, you are um, accepting requests from everybody from anybody and so this request must be, must be checked before being executed uh, the validation in the response is less important because after all the client asks for something from, from a server so in a way implicitly the client is trusting that server to give a meaningful response back so there's, there's less uh, issue of trust uh, the client receives a, re a, a response to a request that it did hmm? uh, the the, the reverse is not true the server will receive a request from any client in the world that doesn't know and so it doesn't trust doesn't need to trust um, alessandro uh, is also asking something about validation whether this validation fund provides sanitization to input avoid to avoid injection um, so uh, injection may happen at different places uh, in your uh, in your in our uh, code pipeline you may we may have a first injection at the uh, request parsing level okay so if you try to parse a query string uh, naively by looking for question marks or looking for uh, ampersands uh, or looking for spaces or something like that uh, probably in your code there will be some some bugs uh, for sure because we, and uh, and uh, we risk of getting some or injecting some variable which was not supposed to be um okay uh, we avoid this kind of uh, let's say injection through the urls or through the http request formed malformed http request 
if we rely on the on the library so right now we are not we are never parsing by hand the url we are never parsing by hand the body we are never parsing by hand the the, the, the path fragments express is doing that for us and so we are trusting that uh, it's blocking some most of the uh, attempts uh, to to um, to fake me okay uh, to to inject some data uh, wrong data so we are in a way protected by that by not doing the computation ourselves and letting let this computation be done by a library that uh, is uh, more robust in that uh, aspects then once we have some data okay user id here uh, what if this contains some uh, you know sql injection script or whatever okay then will be our our problem okay we can do some checks and some checks are maybe uh, on the format uh, done by the validator so we can block you can ensure that the format is some types uh, but for example if we are expecting a string uh, this string can be anything we cannot do a lot of validation on a generic uh, string type um, and so we must be sure that uh, for example when executing a query in the sql code we are using parameter queries and we are not just concatenating the, the strings so at every point uh, we need to there's a different chance of getting it wrong and uh, <coughs> and in general the solution is don't try to do stuff by hand okay uh, because uh, input data may not be what you think it is and so if you rely on uh, the parameter queries or in the validation in the parsing of the query by the library you are more sure that uh, you are not manipulating or touching uh, user data directly that can be that can be dirty uh, so unfortunately there's a, there are different levels and each each level we should protect ourselves uh, at the same time we are in a web application course so we don't want to spend uh, spend 95 percent of our code in validation error checking error messages and so on okay so we want to have some reasonable protection but we are not going to in this course uh, to learn how to do high security applications okay uh, because that would take uh, a lot more uh, more time that we are we are already running <laughs> with all the topics in this course okay so we try to give you some pointers about the, the most important things you can do especially the library where you can rely for doing most of the work for you mm -hmm. and uh, the getting in the habit of uh, finding the right way of doing that instead of trying to do it by hand and then uh, forgetting something okay um, right so right now we we have some basic uh, understanding of how to create uh, some uh, some api methods some say, http methods we didn't do anything useful here okay uh, because we need to understand how to use this capability in our client server application um, uh, pattern how to use and we will learn how to uh, use a web server for implementing an api for uh, um, for a web application uh, for a client application so we are not going here to describe all the details about how to build a web application but just now focus about okay now we have this how can we um, for example in our example uh, application of this course on the university course uh, how can we have a, a server where the scores and the exams the courses are stored and can be accessible by the client how can we use this uh, um, web server to give us access to the courses and to the exams and let us modify them okay so this is something that we are going to see after the break uh, where we see some uh, say guidelines very simple guidelines on how to implement HTTP APIs and we see also the code that we are trying to work in this uh, React score server there's another project in this uh, there's another folder in this project where we already have uh, uh, implemented some uh, uh, in this class uh, in this file dao.js uh, we already implemented uh, uh, some queries that we have from the beginning of the course basically okay uh, where we can uh, insert and query uh, the, the exams and the courses and so we try to uh, understand how to pass from the 
database, the SQLite database, and the SQLite code for querying database to some API that the browser is able to call. Okay, so this will be our job for the next uh, uh, for the second hour. And uh, right now, I think that uh, we should have a break, and so we can start again at uh, we are 10 tanks or 10 uh, 25. If there are no questions, yes, I will save the code just in the, during the break. Okay, so see you in 15 minutes as usual.